Here's what I've discovered. God has this wonderful sense of humor that says, you're not going to like this at first. But he doesn't say that at, he doesn't say that at first. He just says, you're not going to like this. But it's not until it's afterward that you like it, that something happens and you say, God, I like this. I like this. And so here's Jacob. He's encountering and God's telling him something and what life is going to be like. And he's landed, he lighted on a place. Some of you are here for the first time and you've never been in anything like this and you're gonna see something you've never seen before, but I'm telling you, don't run away. Don't run out. It's like Don Basham used to say, when we're casting out demons, everybody holds still. He says, but, if you see me run, that's the time for everybody to run. God's moving. God's doing something. And even when you can't see him, he's working. He's creating an atmosphere. You're saying, God, I'm hungry for you. He says, all right, let's go over here. And you say, over there, over where? Over here in the dark. And you find that right now, and here's what Jacob found. Now, I don't know if he ever came to the realization, but he... He identified the place where he was as Bethel or the house of God. It was formerly called Luz, L-U-Z, house of God, Luz. People who live in Luz are called losers. I love an atmosphere where God comes and says, y'all want to have some fun today? I say, yeah. He said, okay. You really want to? See, see, God has this wonderful thing. And I, I try to tell people all the time that God is not a conservative God. God does crazy stuff. That's right, Joseph, he does. And sometimes it doesn't look crazy right away. Or sometimes it looks crazy right away. And then you got to say, God, are you in that? And so when my friend who had been a reformed Episcopal minister comes into a Pentecostal service, something like he's never been in before, he said when he walked in, there was a little old lady in front of him and she had some sneakers, not tennis shoes. She had sneakers tied by a string over her shoulder as she was coming in. And Bob asked her, he said, honey, what are those for? And she looked at him, she says, why, preacher, those are my shouting shoes. He said, okay. And he sat down and it went crazy. It went absolutely crazy. And he said, God, I'm supposed to preach tonight. Are you in this place? And the Lord says, put your hands up and see. <laughs> you know the story. You know the end of the story before I tell it. He put his hand up. Uh, See, it didn't start in Toronto. It started years ago when I was a little boy. Uh, when the Holy Ghost would hit you and you just, uh, why are you feeling this way? You can't even talk straight words. Come out of your mouth. Uh, 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 uh. I was 12 years old. And the Holy Spirit was moving. He always started in the choir. He'd work his way out into the audience. Now, some of you may not understand this, and some of you may not believe it because you never had the experience. But I would sit there, and I could tell it's coming this way. I'm sitting next to my uncle, and I'm saying, it's soon going to get here. And so I would go to the bathroom until it passed. I'm just telling you the truth. Our service was so long, we had to go to the candy store and, you know, get a lot of stuff so that we survived the story. And I, I would buy nuts and candies and I'd put them in my pocket. And on this particular occasion, the Holy Spirit started to move, but he didn't start in the choir. He started on the row where I was. And the next thing I knew, I was on the floor and I was rolling back and forth and I was saying to God, no, no, no. And he was ignoring me because somebody said, you've got a free will. And I said, no, God's going to get rid of the free will. Free willy is what he's after. <laughs> no, no, 
no. And peanuts and candy were coming all out of my pocket. They were scattered all over the floor. And if you couldn't tell where I was, you knew where I'd been. So when I hear people say, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, I said, not in the church I grew up in. But I'm saying to you, you can have an encounter with God if you don't tell him what kind of encounter you want to have. Because Jesus said he knows what you have need of before you ask. And what some of us need is a shaking that will move us outside of our parameters of, 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 of dignity and stature and everything else. Hey, just put your hand up and say, hey, God, mess me up. We need a word from God. We need a move from God. We need to understand that in some of the greatest moments of chaos, God is right in the center of it, orchestrating a lot of things that are going on, creating a circumstance in which he will show himself strong. And we ought to be able to walk through something and just say, all right, God, just stop me when I get to the thin place. When I get to that place where heaven and earth come together and there seems to be nothing that separates it, you don't have to struggle to get there. You just step over into it. And when you step over into it, you can say things you never said. You can sing songs you never heard. You can preach messages you never thought you could preach before because in that setting, God is creating an atmosphere that says, I'm here and I just want to know if you'll join me in it. Get out of your comfort zone. Get to a place where you can say, God, I am, have you ever been really hungry? No, I'm, I'm saying really hungry. Have you, been, have you ever been hungry, but you didn't know what you were hungry for? We're sitting in a restaurant. And my wife says, honey, are you hungry for something? I said, yeah, what do you want? I said, I don't know. You ever been in this restaurant before? Never been here before. And so you sit there and you're all looking at the menu. And then the waiter comes by. And the smoke is coming off that stuff and, and you're smelling it. And you do like this. And he delivers it. When he comes back, you say to him, what was that? And he gives you the name. And you say to her, that's what I want. Sometimes you don't know what you want. Sometimes you don't know what you're hungry for until you see somebody else with it. Sometimes you don't know what is desperate in your life until you find somebody saying, but I was in that same place. That's my story. Have you ever heard anybody sing, this is my story, this is my song, and you're sitting there listening to them and they're telling your story, they're telling your life. You're listening and you're saying, God, how can the same thing happen to the to somebody and I don't even know him. He said, he said, I just do that kind of work. And you're there. Oh, lift your hands in sweet surrender to his name. God, I want to be saved. I want, I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. God, I want to be healed. Mainline minister was in the hospital. He was dying. And he said, God, isn't there somebody who can come? Is there somebody you can send to pray for me? And a Pentecostal guy came past his room, saw him there, heard him pray. And he came in and he started bouncing on the guy's bed and shaking the bed, calling on Jesus. And the man just says, sir, would you please leave? I'm so sick. He God says, sure. And he walks out. He said, oh, God. Oh, God, won't you just send somebody? He said, I just sent somebody. And you sent him away. And he yelled, come back. And he came back. He said, shake my bed. When he got finished shaking him and shaking the bed, he was healed. The answer that you want may not come looking like you want it to come. But who cares as long as it's the answer? And it's not like God is saying, you're going to have to be like that. I see some people move in the power of God and I just say, God, that's really cool for them. 
But they used to tell me in the early days of the renewal, just let me know when I'm getting too close. Right. <laughs> in the early days of the charismatic renewal, you remember this, when people who had been raised in the mainline church and other mainline charismatics who had, who had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit just so sweetly and so wonderfully. And they would say to these people who were intimidated because they didn't want to be Pentecostals. They just wanted the Holy Ghost. And they would say to us, now I'm not going to do anything stupid. And I said, no, 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 don't worry about that. The Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman. Flashback. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm thinking, gentlemen. <laughs> if he is a gentleman, then why when we pray for ladies are we always ready to have those nice little cloths that we cover them up with? Her sister-in-law, Baptist, sweet Baptist school teacher, I'm doing a revival service and I'm praying for people and so when I come to her, I said, how can I pray for you? She said, I wish to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I don't want to fall. And I said, fine. And I prayed for her and I said, Jesus, baptize her in the Holy Spirit and don't let her fall. He heard the first part. <laughs> Didn't hear the second part. She fell, and it wasn't no one of those cool slide down falls. She fell on her behind. And, and I think, I'm pretty sure, I think when her butt hit the floor, her tongue started talking. And I just looked at her and said, well, I did my best. And I kept going on, and I walked. When I came back, she was so caught up in God's presence. I helped her up, and I said, how are you doing? I said, I'm sorry you fell. She said, don't even worry about it. There, there can come a moment in your life when the encounter that you have with God is so transforming, it has no connection and it has nothing to do with the how, how you got where you are, but what he did when you were there. Are they screaming, telling God, oh God, and this is later on. I'm in a whole different place now and I want all that God has for me. Don't ask God to give you all that he has if you only want a portion. My pastor was sitting at the table and the lady was feeding him okra and he said he enjoyed okra but she put so much more on his plate and she said, have some more. He said, man, I can't eat anymore. My socks won't stay up. Some of these stories, I, it's obvious that it's out of your world. Okra is slimy. <laughs> but he had had enough. There are some things that people have and they will look at it. We were being touched by God in Toronto and some of my team were being flattened by God. And we had a couple who were with us and I, I said, would you like prayer? She said, no way. I said, none of them, no way. But then others are like my, my grandkids who come to see me when they were really small and they would say, Papas, Papas, I said, what? Throw me up in the air, and I'd throw him up in the air. And they'd say, do it again. And I'd throw him up in the air. And they would have a little friend with them. And they would say, me too, me too. And I would get them, and I'd throw them up in the air, but they didn't know what that was like. And when they would come back down, they'd say, put me down. Put me down. Some people want to be thrown up in the air until they're thrown up in the air. And then they'll say to you, put me down. I, I, that's, that's, more, that's more church than I want. But those who are looking on and know what it's like, they'll say, do me, do me. And I'm looking at God every now and then and I'm seeing somebody turn down what he's doing for others because they don't like the way it looks. And I'm looking at them and I'm looking at him and I'm saying, Papa, <laughs> do me. Put your hand up and say, do me, God.